Your body does this every day. Kills cancer cells. That's part of its job. The innate immune system, the adaptive immune system, the innate immune system, that's a stuff you don't even know it's there. These are the guardians at the gate. Bacteria come in, a cancer cell appears, squash. Yeah, before you even know you had it. Isn't that beautiful? I'm gonna be talking to you about supplements and their role in preventing and treating prostate cancer. This could be a very short podcast. I could summarize for you the conventional medicine perspective. They don't work. There's no proof of benefit. There you go. That would be the conclusion of the majority, if not every opinion rendered in conventional medical literature. But let's take a step back. Look, you and I know the truth is deeper. The problem, of course, is that these supplements are simply not adequately studied. The vast majority of doctors don't have time, interest, inclination, or motivation to really peel it back and look at the evidence. There is evidence of possible benefit. There is no proof of outcome. I could say the same thing, folks, about conventional treatment. There is no proof that ripping out a prostate gland or irradiating it is going to prevent you from dying of prostate cancer. No proof of that. Yeah, maybe some evidence, but holy cow, the harm done? Don't we need to think more broadly? Well, that's what the podcast focuses on. Why is it that there is so much absence of enthusiasm for looking at your whole body and helping it to fight cancer? I mean, your body does this every day. Kills cancer cells. That's part of its job. The innate immune system, the adaptive immune system. Two components that many supplements and vitamins are critical to support. The innate immune system, that's the stuff you don't even know it's there. These are the guardians at the gate. Bacteria come in, a cancer cell appears, squash. Yeah, before you even know you had it. Isn't that beautiful? They are, if you will, the rapid deployment force. The Marines, they go out there and kill things. You even know they're working. And for that matter, so too are Marines. They're out there working. We didn't get bombed today, yeah? Anyhow, back to the supplements. Then you have the adaptive immune system. This is the part that has to develop, the part that has antibodies formed. And yes, your global health, including micronutrient support, is critical to that. Immune suppression leads to increased cancer risk, period, end of story, irrefutable proof. All these drugs you see that are immunosuppressive in nature, many of them are widely publicized to treat things from ulcerative colitis to psori psoriasis. They all have, in the fine print, increased risk of cancer. So suppressing immune system, bad for cancer. Supporting immune system, likely beneficial. Isn't that just logical? Where do we need irrefutable proof? Well, if you're waiting for it, it's not going to come. But, and part of the reason is that the um, American Cancer Society, I mean, these they do a lot of great work, and I'm not here to disparage their role. However, you have to consider the fact that so from 2010 to 2022, they've received from pharmaceutical companies about $23 million. That doesn't mean that their uh, information is corrupted. However, a company doesn't spend $23 million and expect nothing in return. They want to at least have a favorable impression, right? So there is a sort of um, symbiotic relationship. How much money did... Supplement companies give to uh, American Cancer Society. There's no recorded evidence of any. I mean, it may be there, but not much. Um, so it's not to imply, again, that there's corruption behind it, but there's a lack of enthusiasm for supplements. These doctors, God bless them, they're busy enough to try to figure this out. So this is where you all need help because you've got really, you're, you're stuck. I have great empathy for you. My, my book will help. I hope this podcast helps. Look, look for credible sources. What do I consider to be a credible source? A well-educated, informed, and neutral 
healthcare provider, a physician, a nurse practitioner. Some of my naturopathic colleagues have knowledge in this field and are very helpful. However, be wary of proprietary promoters. This is the biological expert who's promoting supplements in the absence of actually treating patients. So be wary of that. Be wary of the websites and the promotional sites that extol virtues of supplements. You, I've had folks come to me starting a, a program, starting in my protocol, and by golly, they've got 30 supplements. We all have a swallow capacity. We all have a budget. So how do I discern and how can you discern what is worth taking and what isn't? I'm going to share with you my thoughts and opinions on some of the supplements. We'll have It's going to be a two-part series. This is a big topic. It is huge. But here's what you can do. When you're looking for evidence, you want to look at in vitro evidence. That means laboratory studies. Be careful. If the only evidence is in vitro, generally speaking, not good enough. It's a world of difference between a Petri dish and your body. So there's in vitro evidence that supports a theoretical approach. Next step is in vivo evidence, typically in laboratory animals, typically with cancers that have been implanted into the animal. It's called the xenograph. When you take human cancer cells, plop it on some unfortunate mouse. I'm not that fond of mice. It doesn't bother me that we put cancer. So I, although I'm not fond of mice, a weird moral dilemma I had. Stepping outside in my pool, there was a mouse desperately trying to get out, swimming frantically. I panicked. I got my scooper. I helped that mouse, and I set it free. Where's the paradox? I have mouse traps in my garage, and when I see a dead mouse in my trap, I go, yeah, baby. It's all about context. What that has to do with cancer, I suppose it's contextual as well. Look at our supplements. One of the things we talked about is evidence of benefit. So there are the layers, right? Our poor mouse getting cancer, being given a treatment and having benefit. That's stronger evidence. Then we've got the human experience. There are uh, individual case studies. Be careful because their case studies are very limited in their applicability to a broader audience. But then you've got small either pilot studies, 10 people published. That has high value in my opinion because in the world of supplements, Evidence is tough to acquire, and that kind of effort and evidence has merit. You've got the classic double-blind placebo-controlled studies. These folks can cut both ways. It depends on the context. Who's doing the study? What's their motive? What knowledge do they have about the topic they are studying? Nowhere is this more applicable than in vitamin D. Now, vitamin D has been disparaged in conventional medicine as being worthless, more or less, right? It does not show benefit regarding cancer prevention, COVID prevention, infection prevention, says mainstream medicine. Now, that came from a series of studies published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Powerful journal with an abstract, a headline that says vitamin D doesn't work. For busy clinicians, that's all they need to know. Right? It reminds me of the Women's Health Initiative from 30 years ago that crushed hormone replacement, equally misinterpreted. The problem with that study, and I have to talk about it because it is um, coming from a reputable journal that has a lot of sway over conventional medicine. They looked at individuals taking their history to inquire about whether or not they were on vitamin D. The average amount they were taking was 2,000 units. Well, that's problem number one. Generally, way low of a dose, not nearly enough. Problem number two, they didn't look at blood levels in many of the patients. The majority of the subjects, they never tested the blood level. They had no idea how much vitamin D was in the patient or the subject. When they did test it, none of them, almost none, had levels above 50. I think nanogram per deciliter. Now, 50 is a threshold that I look for when I'm interpreting a study. The evidence in functional medicine correlates a blood level of 25 hydroxy vitamin D above 50 with decreased incidence of cancers, 
decreased incidence of viral infections, decreased incidence even of COVID. So you have a study published in a major journal refuting the value of vitamin D with a wrong dose, no blood levels, right? Wrong dose, wrong blood level. All it demonstrated to us is that dose is relevant. I don't think it uh, eliminates its possible benefit. So in my world, in our world, in the protocol I've developed, vitamin D is one of our foundational supplements. 5,000 units a day is the minimum that we start with in our protocol. You have to have vitamin K with it, specifically vitamin K2, aminoquinone. Why? Because vitamin D absorbs calcium. You want calcium, folks, to go into the bone, not to your heart and brain. Right? So vitamin K is a traffic cop. And what does vitamin D do? It's not really a vitamin. It's a hormone. It affects the innate immune system. It has an on switch that helps to activate it. It helps to enhance the production of the components that make up the innate immune system. So we've got an immune supportive dynamic happening with vitamin D. There are studies, a meta-analysis. When you hear me use the term meta-analysis, it is when studies are done looking at other studies. And they will analyze them, and they will statistically combine the data. The first step is to make sure the studies are reasonably uh, similar and that the quality of those studies is of a high nature. They'll take those studies and condense them into one summary. The objective is to try to get stronger evidence of outcome. All right, so that's a meta-analysis. Meta-analysis with vitamin D, there was one correlating with a decreased rate of mortality from prostate cancer. Well, that's pretty good evidence. In my view, in addition, vitamin D is one of those things that has collateral benefit. By that I mean, aside from its potential merit in the face of prostate cancer, either prevention or in the context of supportive treatment, it has secondary benefit to the body at large, supporting immune system, supporting um, mood. There are studies uh, correlating it with enhancement decrease in depression. Seasonal affective disorder, you know how we all get depressed in the dead of winter, may have as much to do with sunlight and vitamin D as anything else. So collateral benefit, nice. In vitro evidence, yes. Mechanism of action, got it. Proof of outcome, not there, folks. Never will be. This is where we, you and I, we have to make our own decisions. Put the evidence in a force. Those of you that are putting together a plan or following some of the evidence and information from this protocol. We have conventional medicine and prostate cancer known to cause harm. Proof of preventing death, not there. That's not too comforting. If you choose conventional medicine, it's not wrong. It's just not enough. You have to add to that equation. So there's vitamin D, one of my foundational elements. Remember, K2 has to go with it. What else is out there? What else can we talk about? How about saw palmetto? Now, some of the supplements I'll talk about, I mention them just to diminish their status. Saw palmetto, a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. What does that mean? It prevents testosterone from converting into dihydrotestosterone, or DHT. Dihydrotestosterone is the type of testosterone that is most accountable for stimulating the growth of the prostate gland and may be a factor in prostate cancer. Soil palmetto is okay. Um, it can be perhaps beneficial if it's synergistically combined with other supplements. However, the evidence regarding it as a freestanding supplement is terribly weak. I do not recommend it as a freestanding supplement. If it's commingled with other agents, it may have value. The studies showing escalating doses, no value. In addition, saw palmetto has no collateral benefit. It does not have any intrinsic health benefit like vitamin D or like vitamin B6, which we'll talk about. It is its own thing. Furthermore, I am, folks, I am a medical agnostic 
when it comes to that which is going to help you fight cancer. I am not dogmatically against everything in the pharmacologic world. In fact, it is true that you cannot drug your way to good health. It's also true, folks, that you can't supplement your way to treating cancer and stopping it. That is a weak approach. So you want to combine things. You don't want to be pigeonholed. So what about saw palmetto? There are pharmacologic agents that do the job far better than saw palmetto, blocking DHT production in a proven way that has been proven to shrink the prostate gland. So you've got a pharmaceutical agent that does the job. You have a supplement that is trying to do the job, has no intrinsic benefit, but doesn't really work as a standalone. So don't burn money on saw palmetto as a standalone supplement. Another thing that, well, I mentioned one that I like. I'm going to get this one in. We'll go to part two after that, right? Vitamin B6, pyridoxine. B vitamins are water-soluble. Relatively speaking, quite safe. Now, your doc who doesn't know any better is going to tell you, you're just going to pee it out. That's nonsense. You could look at my book, Vitamized Health. It explains the role of intravenous vitamins and vitamins in general in detail. Suffice it to say that the effect of these vitamins is durable beyond the length of time that it stays in the body. I like B6 because it supports the immune system. It has collateral benefit. In addition to its potential benefit and anti-tumor effect, I like the fact that its relationship has been associated with decreased propagation of cancer. It's not proven benefit. It's not a cure for cancer. But it's a safe, water-soluble vitamin that you need. It's an essential vitamin. Supports immune function. How much do you need? Well, it may vary depending on your stress level. However, it can be harmful. Do not take more than 100 milligrams per day. It can cause neuropathy, burning and tingling in the hands and fingers, altered balance, altered vision. So for those of you that are taking multiple supplements, look for B6, add them up. It better be below 100 milligrams. If not, then junk some of them. You want to stay in a safe range, folks. Ah, there's a lot to talk about. These supplements are an important adjunct, but I want you to be focused. Do not choke on 20 supplements. Do not chase the breadcrumbs to highly promoted supplements that have little to no value. I'm going to try to help guide you through those. More to talk about. I'll leave you with one that I that highly promoted but has no merit. Apricot seeds. Just stop already. I get it. They have some laetrile in them, and laetrile might have value in cancer. It's illegal to use in the United States. It's available in Mexico intravenously. For many reasons, I don't advocate that you head to Mexico to get it, not the least of which is the expense. And my approach, that is chronic suppression rather than acute intervention. But apricot seeds cannot acquire levels sufficient to have any impact and if you attempt to acquire high enough levels, it can be toxic. Cyanide poisoning can occur. So just leave the apricot seeds aside. Vitamin D, absolutely. With vitamin K, add it. Vitamin B6, you got it. Don't go above 100 milligrams. We'll talk about some other of the foundational components in part two. Maybe also highlight some of the ones to avoid. Thanks for your time. We'll catch you next on the podcast.